that you experience a God who breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. <clears throat> Otherwise, you probably need to find a bigger God, a bigger religion, something different. If this is the God we worship, our sins better be getting dealt with. This doesn't mean we get rid of all of our sins, but we better be getting dealt with. We better be making progress. And we better be becoming more like Christ. Because that's the goal. So that's the task in front of us as our church. We need to become part of a church that's doing that. And each of us must attest to that. And God wraps His arms around us in deep love. And He comforts us deeply. And we experience that God in this church. And we experience this God who comes and disciplines us. And is strict with us. And rebukes us. Because He loves us. Because that's also love in Hebrews 12. And we experience that. But we grow through that. We become more like Christ. That I want the goal of anybody who is part of our church, who's committed to the elders here. That's the mark of being part of this church, is that you're willing to submit to the elders. <clears throat> That's the sign of being part of the family, is you're willing to be under the father and the mother in the context of the church, the elders. But that if you're part of this church, people who see you two, three years from now will see a marked difference. The frown is gone. A cheerful face is lighting you up more. <clears throat> Christ is starting to become more of your everything. <clears throat> if not, you need to find another church. If not, I need to find another church. If that's stopping to happen, if I start to sit back. That is our goal. And I rejoice to see progress. And we see progress as people get up and speak and as we talk, but we hear progress, people moving to become more like Christ, people seeing a bigger God, people getting, um, learning bigger nuances of what it means to really have faith in God, not to trust in our feelings, how to finish the race that we started, how to finish strong, how we must become more like servants, who, do, who are our heroes in our lives. Not to be distracted by those who are making lots of money, who've got lots of gifts, who can speak. Ephesians is a passage. If you would turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter four, three, and Ephesians chapter three is a. This is a verse that we memorized last year. Ephesians three and four start to talk about the church life. Ephesians one and two and part of three talks about how great a gift God has given to us. Though you were dead in your transgressions, it says in Ephesians chapter two. And then he says, he seated you in the heavenlies and seated you in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6. And that you're accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1. All kinds of beautiful verses that I hope that your, the eyes of our heart will be opened, Ephesians 1, 18, to the riches of his glory. And then Ephesians 3 and 4 talks about how we have to do this in the context of a church. And Ephesians 3, 14 through 20, 21 is what we memorized. And that's the introductory part to how you move beyond an individual Christian life to a, to a life that is incorporated with other people. That's the problem with David. David had no ability to really be united with other people because he didn't have the Holy Spirit side of him resting and living in him. And then in other people as well, the Holy Spirit came upon him, but not inside of him. And we see that in here. That God wants to dwell in us. It's only through Christ that that's possible. And that's through the Holy Spirit comes and living to us, but it's because of our faith in Christ. So this is a passage we have memorized, but I just wanted to underline a couple of thoughts that as I sought the Lord of what I should speak on today. This is the passage that came this mind, to mind. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 onwards. If you read in your Bibles, it says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell, may live, may abide, may move all His stuff and bring it into your house. He's not getting kicked out tomorrow. 
may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Say that to yourself, out loud. That's what God wants to do to you. That you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Throw away your false sense of humility. This is God's word. He says it very clearly that that's what He wants from your life. Yes, my pathetic life. He wants this from us and He gives me that pathway. It starts by Paul saying, let me explain it to you. No, he doesn't. He wants this to be true in the Ephesians and he says, I bow my knees before the Father that he would grant you. I said that when we were in our prayer time to do the biggest virtue I long for about our church is that we stay hungry for Jesus Christ. We stay hungry. We yearn at the night times to spend a few minutes talking to Jesus Christ before we, die, before we go to sleep. And in the morning, before the dawn arises, if, it, if that's how early some of us need to get up, that we yearn to talk to Jesus. And it's a, it's a battle, but it's a posture of the heart that we must really covet to bow my knees we live in such a world and for us who are serious Christians we have it all the methodology down here we've got the theology figured out that I don't feel the many times a day need to bow my knees not physically but my heart and say Lord Jesus I need you Now, I struggle with that too because I'm not this person going around constantly lusting and stealing and getting angry. I've got the methodology. I've, I've understood the theology well enough. I have crucified my flesh and my will that it's usually Jack stays in the box. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it there. Now what do I do? That I don't I lose the cry that, Jesus, I need you. I want you. Because man lives by words that proceed. And I stop asking myself, Lord, I didn't do anything that bad, did I? So we're okay. To say, Lord, I am not filled up to the fullness of God. I've set my bar so low. Didn't do any major sin is my bar. Pornography was the bar. Not flirting with women was the bar. Not blowing up at my co-workers was the bar. I got there. I brought my armchair out and I sat down. The bar was the fullness of God. Had the wrong bar. When I find the right bar, I say, Lord, I need to bow my knees. I need to bow my knees before the Father and say, Lord, you need to give it to me. You need uh, That you may grant me. According to the riches of your glory, you've got it. It's a deep confidence in the Father that He can give it to you. I, I don't know if I'm the only one who's too easily satisfied, who got to that bar, who just got so satisfied with that life. But when I see the fullness of God, and I, that I may be filled up, I say, Lord Jesus, it's easy for me to be hungry. I get that. I should be hungry. So that I could be strengthened with power through His Holy Spirit. I constantly ask myself, Lord Jesus, did I speak with an anointing today? I speak with passion. That's my personality. I fear that you'll mistake that for the anointing. God's not fooled. The devil's not fooled. I'll fool some of you guys. I don't fool God or the devil. And I seek that the Lord will say, His anoint My anointing is resting on you. That I can speak slowly and I can speak broken in 
in broken words, but there was an anointing on my life. I covered that over my natural talent to speak with passion. And I, f- I f- can fool many people, but I can't fool God. And I long for His anointing, and for that I need to bow my knees and say, Lord, grant it to me. I'm supposed to speak a few minutes today. What can I do? How can I minister unto you? Who washed Jesus' feet? I don't know. Nobody did in John 13. The feet that was the most dirty, I get to wash His feet. I get to say, Lord Jesus, what I speak to you, to these people today, is my way of washing your feet. It's my offering to you. That's the soberness with which I speak. And I need help for that. I need to bow my knees and say, Father, I need help. And I need to bow my knees when I go to work to help my co-workers. And I need to bow my knees when I'm interacting with my children. And I need to bow my knees and say, Lord, grant me the strength according to the riches of your glory. You've got it. I'm not going to doubt you. But strengthen me with your spirit in the inner man. So that Christ may dwell, not visit, not come in and out, but live. Does Jesus feel so comfortable that he just lives in your heart? Family, that's the goal. That's what he wants to do in each of your hearts. I don't care how young you are. Teenagers, God wants to make your heart a home. Where he can sit and he say, Jesus, you're welcome anytime. You tell me to throw that piece of furniture out, out it goes. He wants, you can do that. Because Jesus was your age and God lived in him. You can do that. It's not an age barrier. It's not for the 50 and 60 and 70 year olds. Can God find 13 year olds, 15 year olds who want that? I hope this church will be a place where we'll find such people. Where God can abide If God abides with you, love is what's living in you. Love. That is why it says that when Christ abides in you, that you'll be rooted and grounded in love. Why? Because that's what is living in there, is love. An absolute primal love for Jesus Christ and a love for one another. That it'll be rooted and grounded because God's not being kicked out every third day. Because now I don't want to obey my parents. Because now I want to do my own will. Because now I want to watch that thing. Because now I want to read that article. And God's opening up different levels of the onion in which I make Christ uncomfortable. Maybe it's just reading a five minute article. For the first 45 minutes I was great on CNN. But it's just that one little article God was saying, you're not trying to actually make me a home. You don't want to be filled up with all the fullness of God. And I've had to learn to be better at cutting it off. Harmless articles, but taking me down the wrong path. This is the secret to being rooted and grounded in love, is make Jesus Christ the place where He can call home, which is your heart. Say, Jesus, you can come in any time. You'll always be welcome in my home, which is my heart. So when the Holy Spirit comes and starts to convict you of sin, you take it seriously. That is why we make a big deal out of sin. Because sin is the thing that makes Jesus Christ uncomfortable. Because the Holy Spirit gets uncomfortable with unholiness. Goes against His very name. That's why we take sin seriously. And then we be rooted and grounded in love. And then it says, an interesting word, I thought about this in verse 18 and 19, 18, that you may be able to comprehend, look at that verse in your Bibles, verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Did I read that right? No, I didn't. That I may be able to comprehend with all the saints. This is the beauty of the church. 
But I try to try and understand the love of God in a, by myself and in my Bible study and in my prayer closet. And I get one little puzzle piece. That's all you'll get. A puzzle piece that when put together shows the entire face of Christ. Who's got the rest of the pieces of the puzzle? The church. So which church you go to is important. They have the right puzzle pieces. To the, are they looking in the face of Christ? Are they just following tradition? Or they just want to go to heaven? Do they want to be filled up to all the fullness of God? Such people have puzzle pieces that can fit really well with you if that's what you want to. Comprehend with all the saints. I, can only, I can't explain it to you, but I can testify that that has been true in my life. As I've sat here and as I've listened, and as I've listened to people who want to be one with one another share in two minutes, in five minutes, in a few minutes their honest, sincere walk with God, I find puzzle pieces fitting in next to mine. I see a clearer picture of Jesus Christ. So I've only begun to understand the face of Christ when I try to sit by myself, but it's only when I covet what somebody else is going to tell me about their view of Christ. And I don't dismiss them because of their lack of gifting to speak, to put a thought together. I say, Lord Jesus, where is, has this person been walking with you? I want a sense in my spirit. Has this person been walking with you? Then a mother who doesn't, who's uneducated in the villages of India has something to say to me. And I've experienced that when I go to India. I, my heart has gotten a little better at it. Where people, there could be a mother who just didn't finish high school. I'm thinking of some people too. Didn't finish high school, raised children, stayed at home. That's all they did. But I speak to them, something in my spirit says, there's Christ in there. She's got a wisdom from walking with God for 30 years that you don't listen to her. Others, she's never going to stand up and speak. Not a chance. But she's got Christ. That's what we need to hear. That's what we need to be like. People who are so, Lord, my, what is her life? You could think of it as Psalm 63. A wilderness, all by herself in a little kitchen with her children. All that she's doing is cleaning diapers and then getting them to figure out how, what 2 plus 2 is. Getting them to become 18. It's kind of like Psalm 63, but her heart said, oh, my heart yearns for you, Jesus. She did that for 30 years and all that comes out now is just fragrance. The fragrance of Christ. So I don't need to covet all the sermons listening and I don't have to beat myself up that I can't listen to as many sermons or I can't grasp as many sermons. I get the Spirit of Christ coming out of me. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Does that mean that we will be like God? That we will be gods? No. What does that mean? It's like a bottle that's in the ocean. And when it is completely submerged, it's filled up to the fullness of the ocean. It is not the ocean. We will not be the ocean. But we can be filled up to the fullness of the ocean in our little bottles. That I can be poured out and all that comes out is the ocean. None of that junk that was used to be there when I was on the shore. Let me get off the shore and let me get into the ocean. So the ocean water cleans out all that sand that I'm emerged in the ocean of love, submerged in the ocean of love. And whenever I'm asked to pour something out, all that comes out is the ocean of love. I'm not, a, I'm, not the, I'm not the ocean myself. I'll never be anything close to that. I'll be so grateful for the ocean. And I'll know where I need to get the ocean from water again when I'm poured out. Got to go back and submerge myself in the ocean. And I can pour some of that fullness of God. We being rooted and grounded in love. And then we can comprehend. How do we get rooted and grounded in love?
How do we know that we are bowing our knees before this Father? It says in verse 14, right? I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. <clears throat> so nobody's in excluded. I don't care what your last name is. I don't care what your culture was. You derive your last name from the Father in heaven. Everybody's part of this story. But how do I know that I'm have this father what's the proof that I have that love in my heart that I'm being rooted and grounded in love that I have such a magnificent father who is the creator of the universe that I bow my knees and I'm talking to him what's the proof that's where John 13 is the evidence of it John 13 1 he says he knew he was going to depart out of the world and he was going to go back to his father. Soon and very soon you're going to see this king and this king is going to be Jesus Christ and we're going to get to know the father. <clears throat> but because in verse 13, 1 it says he's having loved his own because he had such a deep love and we say, I have a love for my brothers and sisters too. And verse 3 is a very important verse. This is the goal for us as well as the proof of it verse 3 and 4 put your name in there instead of Jesus put your name in there Sandeep knowing that the father has given all things into his hands and that he came from God and because Sandeep knew he was going back to God let's stop there do I know that? As the Father has sent me, so send I you, Jesus said. That God loves me just as much as he loved Jesus. Put your name in there. Father has bestowed the riches of his glory onto you. And he says, you came from me and you're going to come back to me. I'm sending you out just like I sent Jesus out in the, in the first cause. You're not that big ocean. You're just this bottle. But it was sent with the same ocean inside of it. What's the proof? What's the proof? Verse 4. Got up and took a towel. And we know what he did. He washed his disciples' feet. That's the proof. The proof of me knowing I have a father is that I long to serve. I long to be a servant. And I don't long to be served. I don't look for ways in which I can have my needs met. I look for ways in which I can help other people. That is why I hate the individualistic, consumeristic church experience. Jesus, knowing that He came from the Father and He was going back to the Father and that He, all things were given into His hands, got up and served and got up and said, how can I help these other brothers and sisters? I came from a good family. This person didn't. What can I do to help them? How can I be merciful to them? How can I encourage them? But instead, I fear that our lot could be and our problem could be that we get so busy studying God's word, understanding good theology, getting coming to a church like this where we preach good doctrine and we feel comfortable that we're doing all the right thing, but we don't ever have such a knowledge that God is our Father and that we're going to go back to, go back to God that we get up and we serve. That we don't become people of who are great in the kingdom of God those who serve who look for areas in which to say this is where somebody needs some help not interested in finding out how other people are doing I'm always looking and saying hey look they're not doing anything for me they're not helping me or what can I get out of this church what can I do There are ways in which I can serve, but they really subtly help me. 
I'll pick an area for me. I don't, I'm, I'm not speaking to anybody else. I don't call what I do when I play the piano serving. I enjoy playing the piano. And it's not hard work for me. I mean, for me, I pick some songs and I'm, God's given me the ability and the years to play it. I can play it. I never understood when people said, I really love the way you served God through music. Maybe. I don't, I don't look at it that way. Because it didn't cost me anything. I enjoy it, for crying out loud. Give God something that costs you something. Taking my friends to eat Indian food is not serving them. <laughs> I love Indian food. <laughs> maybe some other cuisines. <laughs> then maybe I could be a sacrifice. <laughs> but not Indian food. I didn't do a great service to you when I took you to my favorite Indian restaurant. Do you get it? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. What is it in the context of our church? Do we in our culture need our feet to be washed? I don't think so. But this church needs things to be done. I think setting up the chairs is more of a washing people's feet than washing people's feet. It needs to be done. These people were going to be sitting on the ground, probably going to be eating food, and their smell of their feet, somebody needed to wash it so that it didn't smell so bad, it was dirty, so it was clean. In our church, we need chairs to be set up. What about chairs to be put back? What about audio? What about PowerPoint? How many of you enjoy the PowerPoint? <laughs> Very basic PowerPoint. But well, who's going to do it? You know who's been doing it for two, three years? How many people we have in this church? I'm not talking to the visitors. But... I can come and consume, but not think about little ways in which I can help. Who maintains the website? Who does little things like that? The moment I say this, I knew what I was getting myself into. I wrote it down here. <laughs> now, the moment I say this, I know it can become a new rule. I'm reading. Sunny doesn't like it when I leave early. So fine, I'll stay until it's all cleaned up. <laughs> now it's another rule. That's not the intent. I'm asking about a heart that asks that kind of question. That says, what's the need? That when I walk by and I see the potluck we're going to have, <laughs> it needs to be cleaned up. Can I take five minutes to clean up a couple of dishes before I leave? that maybe I give myself an extra buffer, that I cut short a conversation with my favorite person to talk to at church. So let's clean up a couple of dishes. And I walk by and I see the audio not put away and I say, let, let me do this before I leave. Five minutes. That some people may not be able to come early, but may be able to stay a little later. That we don't have visitors stuck with this two people left and be like, 25 things to do, so I, they got to stay behind and help. And that's happened. You guys know me well enough to not take this as a rule. You know me well enough to not take this as a chastisement. But I wanted to explain what washing people's feet meant. I don't believe we need to wash people's feet physically. I've had that experience done. I've done it to other people. I don't believe it's in scripture that we ought to do it to practice that physically. But there are plenty of ways in which if our church is to be like a family, we've got to do it. Ask yourselves that question. The mothers are in the back with the children all by themselves. Do you think they may need a break? Somebody to hold the kids? Look, I'm telling you of things that this church has been good at. There are people I can think of who do that and do it well. So this is not something I'm saying we don't do. We all have to grow in that. We all must be asking the question, what can I give? What can I do to help? And it's the last thing we need is money. <laughs> Most other churches say the first thing we need is open your checkbook now. 
We heard from Psalm 119, so think of a multiplier of Psalm 119 and write that number down. That's not this church. Think of some way in which you can give that costs you something that you don't want to give. Who picks up the garbage every week? Is it the same usual people? There are so many ways, if we think about it, there are ways in which we can wash people's feet. It was Jesus sitting there saying, there's a need that needs to happen. I need to do it. And this world is filled, and I am part of this corporate world where now I'm in management. So the world tells me, delegate. Delegate. Give it to other people to do it. Because you have been gifted with managerial skills. <laughs> means nothing in the church. The greatest in the church is a servant. The greatest is the one who is like a child, is like a servant. And the more we are like Christ, the more we don't want to delegate, we want to give. I remember my mom at her 70th birthday, she said, I am so afraid because we had a, a celebration for her. She said, I'm so afraid that because you now you're celebrating me, I lose my celebration in heaven that Christ is going to give me. She didn't want people to know what she was doing. She wanted it to be all hidden. Because she took that, Matthew 6, the things that you do in secret, Father will celebrate in heaven. And she so coveted that. And I covered that heart of a servant in this matter, that I want to do the things that nobody will find out about. I don't need to explain to the elders, hey, by the way, I want you to know I'm doing my 10 minutes worth of servanthood. There's no desire in that. It's a heart that wants to serve, that wants to comprehend with all the saints what is the love and the breath. And knows that you're important for that. Maybe you had a good quiet time week this week. But maybe the person sitting you next to you didn't. And they need help with an encouraging word. So it doesn't hurt you to spend a few minutes afterwards to just encourage them. I was sharing this with Bobby. I'll share this in closing. Galatians chapter 6. Let me share this to you about serving because this is important. Because we can now... Some people probably are sitting listening to what I said and saying, man, Salim, I'm glad you said this because about time people started helping me with the things I was looking for. Galatians chapter 6, a good metric on how to understand helping one another. Verse 2, it says, bear one another's burdens. That's kind of what I've been talking about. Therefore, fulfill the law of Christ because... Because you better bear one another's burdens and then fulfill the law of Christ. Because if anyone thinks he's something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. The mark of thinking you're something when you're nothing is when you think you have no, no need to bear other people's burdens. That you just need to come and hear a good sermon and leave. You just need to have good teaching. It's a mark that you think you're something when you're nothing. Each one must examine his own work. Verse 5. But in verse 5, each one will bear his own load. Each one bears his own load, but each one desires to bear another's burdens. So if I put the two together, I say, Lord Jesus, anything you've given me, I can handle by myself with you, with your spirit's power. I don't need the church to help me financially, mentally, emotionally. I, I appreciate their words of encouragement whenever they give it to me. But Lord Jesus, I look to you. You are the giver of eternal, words of eternal life, I come to you. But, I want to bear other people's burdens. But I never expect people to bear my burdens. The moment I start expecting other people to bear my burdens, I will go astray. I will become a nuisance. I will become a pain. Bear your own burdens because God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. If you don't have rest, don't go to your brothers. Go to Jesus Christ. But then as we grow mature in the faith, we say, Lord Jesus, maybe I'm the one through whom they'll experience that rest. But we never put that burden, our own burdens on other people. I hope that's clear. Don't put your burdens on other people. Look to God. He's the provider of rest. He says, He will never leave you nor forsake you. Find that relationship with God. But then... Because we are of Christ and we want to fulfill the law of Christ, we say, let me help other people too. 
And it's constantly other people seeking to bear their own burdens and seeking to help other people. That is the law of Christ. Jesus never gave his burdens to his disciples, but he took care of the disciples' burdens. That is the mark of being a servant of Christ. Let us be filled up to all the fullness of God. Let us spend a few minutes. We don't want to end too quickly. Let us spend a few minutes thinking about what has been said. I have been blessed by what I heard this morning from the other people. So just because I spoke last, let the Holy Spirit bring to remembrance something that God spoke to you today through somebody who got up and spoke. May have been one sentence that really challenged you. Do business with God. He gave you food. Now eat it. Consume it. Make it a part of your body so that you can grow and become nourished by it. So let's ask God, Lord, what was the word that you spoke to me? Very clearly, that was from you. Maybe it was a verse. Ask the Lord to really grab a hold of that and let that seed go all the way down into the soil of your heart.
Let me end with a word of hope and encouragement. The way we serve is in light of God's mercies. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Sacrifices in light of God's mercies. And let me end with what I started with. The God's great mercy is not that He looks at you and says, Forgiven. He doesn't look at you and say, Have you never sinned? He looks at you and says, You've always obeyed. Grab a hold of that family of God. Those of you who are beating yourself in the back, or on the front, wherever you are, look at this Jesus who says, I look at you as if you've always obeyed. In light of that, offer your bodies. Sacrifice. Give. We serve Him. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we are so deeply thankful for this gospel, this good news, that you come to us and say, I look at you as if you've always obeyed. It's not because of our filthy rags. It's because of the finished work of Jesus Christ and His righteousness. So we come boldly into your presence, Lord, and we want to have full confidence rooted and grounded in love to serve, to give, to give of ourselves, to pour out our whole bodies as a drink offering for the rest of our lives, that others may be satisfied, that you may get the glory. Bless us, Lord Jesus, as we fellowship with one another. Help us to seek to help other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen.